My name is Nina Eitzheim. Um, I'm professor of musicology and founder and director of the Practice-Based Experimental Epistemology Research Lab or Peer Lab at UCLA. And um, this event is put on by the Peer Lab. And uh, as probably most of you, we have spent the past year working quietly at our kitchen tables and in our backyards. And it's so nice to finally welcome you and uh, into this space and to spend some time with you today. And as we were preparing um, and setting up our mics, we were just envisioning that we were sitting under a, you know, a citrus filled garden um, around a picnic table and drinking rosé. So this is the setting that we're welcoming you into. And in the Peer Lab, we have been working on trying to language music um, in, I don't know, in new ways, should I say that? Um, we have been working very intensely on thinking outside, um, a kind of fixed way of thinking about sound and music. And the way that we have done that is very often through questions. So instead of statements, we're trying to ask questions. So for instance, one of the questions that have been very leading for us is if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it still have the same taste? And um, you know, what, what was the music in the violin when it was still a sapling? And we have been asking questions to California, uh, the land that we're you know, now occupying and just trying to learn from that land. And we have, have this whole genre of what we're thinking about as uh, sensory riddles. So this is a long journey. Um, it's a practice that we're committed to trying to learn from um, the music and the sound that we're listening to. So all, across all our projects, we um, are really trying to pay attention to how oppressed groups and, in, in, and individuals survive, pursue knowledge and express joy through music and sound. Um, and we believe that in doing so, what we're really doing is to try to understand what it is to be human. All peer lab work is centered around creative practice. And in today's event, we're gonna focus on the multi-sensory practice of writing books, especially um, around the auditory um, practice of writing books. And we have asked our esteemed authors to reflect on the sound or music that carried them while researching, writing, and thinking about the books that have been just published, are about to be published, and is right, really right in the process of being created at the moment. So <clears throat> I'm gonna say just a few words about how the program will run today. Um, after I introduce my co-host, um, and we have other introductions, we'll each have um, a conversation with each of the authors. And during that time, please feel free to post questions in the chat or just to let me know that you want to ask a question at the very end where we'll have a Q&A period. And um, before we get started, I want to remind you that we're recording the event. Um, if you don't want to be on that recording in, in visual mode, you can turn off your, your camera. If you, <laughs> it's also very lovely to see you. Um, and finally, I wanted to let you know that uh, we're spotlighting the speakers. So if you put yourself on the, um, uh, on the speaker view, uh, that is at the right, um, right hand corner, that will be the best way to see this program. So it's now my very, very big honor to introduce my co-host today, Vijay Iyer. He's a professor of music and African and African-American studies at Harvard University. He received the MacArthur Fellowship, a Doris Duke Performing Art Artist Award, a United States Artist Fellowship, and a Grammy nomination, the Alpert Award in the Arts, and was voted Downbeat Magazine's Jazz Artist of the Year four times in the last decade. These are just a few of his accolades. He's recently uh, served as a composer in residence at London Wigmore Hall. Um, he was the music director at the Ojai Music Festival. And I would imagine many of you were there with me. Many of you who are here <laughs> was also there with us um, and that summer, that early summer. And he has been an artist in residence at the New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Vijay has released 24 albums of his music and unto, um, most recently, Uneasy. A trio session with drummer 
Tajan Zuri and bassist Linda May Hano. And this uh, music is now available to stream or to purchase. And I believe the vinyl um, was released yesterday, right? Or is it today, yesterday or today? Tomorrow, but who's Oh, tomorrow. It? Okay, that was in the <laughs> in general ballpark. So thank you so much, Vijay, for doing this with me today. And I'm handing the microphone over to you. Thanks, Nina. Uh, so flattered to be a part of this. Um, <clears throat> great to see you all gathered here. I'm looking at all the names and it's like my whole Twitter timeline has come to life. So great to see you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm really thrilled, especially to get to sit here and spend some time with three leading lights in the study of Black music, Black literature, Black life, and um, inspirational figures and the humanities. Uh, I'm going to read the three bios. First is Gail Wald. She teaches in the American Studies Department at George Washington University. She is the author of three books, including Shout, Sister Shout, The Untold Story of Rock and Roll Trailblazer, Sister Rosetta Tharp. And It's Been Beautiful, Soul and Black Power Television. Her current project, which she'll talk about today, is Democratic Rhythms, <clears throat> Ella Jenkins, Children's Music and Civil Rights, which traces the life and career of the Black woman who transformed children's music and music education in the United States. Ms. Jenkins, now 96, lives in Chicago. Next is the wonderful Daphne A. Brooks, the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of African American Studies and Professor of Theater Studies, American Studies, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. That sounds like a lot of committee meetings. How do you do it? Uh, and the author of Jeff Buckley's Grace and of Bodies in Descent, winner of the Errol Hill Award for Outstanding Scholarship in African American Performance Studies, and most recently, the magisterial liner notes for the revolution, the intellectual life of Black feminist sound. She has written liner notes to accompany the recordings of Aretha Franklin, Tammy Terrell, and Prince, as well as stories for the New York Times, The Guardian, The Nation, and Pitchfork. And uh, third on the list here, is the wonderful Professor Farah Jasmine Griffin, a dear friend of mine for you know, a couple of decades now. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> uh, professor Griffin is chair and the William B. Ransford Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies and director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies. The William B. Ransford Professor of English and Comparative Literature and African American Studies and affiliate faculty of the Center for Jazz Studies at Columbia University. That too sounds like a lot of committee meetings. <laughs> she is the author of numerous books, including Who Set You Flowing? The American, African American Migration Narrative. If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery in Search of Billie Holiday, which just had its 20th anniversary, is that right? Harlem Nocturne, Women Artists and Progressive Politics During World War II. Griffin's writing also appears in Essence, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, and Art Forum. Her most recent book, which we'll talk about today, is Read Until You Understand, The Profound Wisdom of Black Life and Literature. It will be available in October 21, and we cannot wait. Now I'll hand it off to Nina and Gail to get things flowing. Thank you. So Gail, um, I've been waiting so long to talk with you about this new project um, that is just at your in your desk and in your head and in your ear right now. Uh, can you just introduce us a little bit to since um, I think Daphne and, um, and, and Farah's work some people may know a little bit more about at this point. Um, but I know this is a very new area for you and um, the repertoire. And so can you tell us a little bit maybe about the project, um, but focusing on what has been in your ears um, when you have been conceiving of it? Yeah, well, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I, it's amazing to be here with such an amazing group of people. I will, I will try to get to the, I, we could, I could spend all day kind of spinning the accolades for you, for everyone. I'll, I won't do that, but thank you. This is really fun. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to talk about this new project. So I am writing a, and it's very much in my head now and just beginning to come onto the page, um, a biography, although biography can mean a lot of things and that's still kind of, 
you know, what that means is still very much in play for me. Um, called Democratic Rhythms about Ella Jenkins. So Ella is 96 years old and lives in Chicago. So um, she's very much a part of my life right now. Um, the book argues, and it's not really an argument, it's kind of self-evident, but I hope to make it an argument that um, Jenkins revolutionized children's music by modeling and disseminating a practice she called call and response rhythmic group singing. Um, which is not the name, it's not a method that she pioneered, but kind of what she titled her first album in, in, 19, in the 1950s. Jenkins um, is not a, what, well, she will say she's not a trained musician, although she has a critique of the notion of training, but she will often say she's not a trained musician, but she produced albums that focused on rhythm and her earliest albums from the 1950s and 1960s used Afro-Cuban percussion. She played the conga drum or the bongos to engage children playfully through the exploration of rhythm. And there's much to say about her pedagogy, but I think what's really essential to her work is that she proposed that you know, instead of having a, a teacher at a piano in the front of a classroom, or listening on a phonograph, this is the 50s, to a symphony, um, that, the, that music was the making of the music. And the making of the music could be a practice of radical um, democratic community for children. So really kind of the method, the repertoire of children's music, she changed everything. So the chapter that I'm, so getting to the question about listening, I, you know, so I'm starting, you know, you pick a book and, you know, if you've written a book, you kind of like start with the chapter that feels most urgent to you. And so what I'm working on now is the period of Ella's life between 1951 and 1957. Um, she's from Chicago. Um, she's a, a product of the South Side. She goes to do Sable High School and then she goes to junior college in Chicago. And then she goes out to San Francisco. Someone tells her, why don't you study at San Francisco State? So she leaves home. She leaves her mother and her brother She's never been away from home, goes to San Francisco. And around the time she's getting her degree, um, so she's kind of meeting all kinds of people and there's much to say about her life. But around the time she's getting her degree, she's walking down um, a San Francisco street, which she calls an arty neighborhood. So it could figure that out. Maybe it's North Beach, maybe it's somewhere else. And she sees a black man carrying a conga drum. And she's this, she has this very disarming curiosity, even at 96, she does. And she decides she's gonna go up to this guy and say, like, where can I hear you? Do you play that thing? Where can I hear you play? The man that she ends up approaching on the street, this is around 1951, is Armando Peraza. He's one of the most important Afro-Cuban percussionists working in the United States. He's still kind of um, beginning then. He had recently come to the US with Mongo Santa Maria and he had landed in San Francisco because he was working um, with Slim Guyard out in San Francisco. So she happens to walk up to him and he, he says, I'm just starting this gig at the Cable Car Village, this club. And so she says, okay, I'm gonna come see you. And it changes her life. She goes and hears him and something changes. So in Chicago, um, she, her first love was blues and she learned how to play harmonica from her uncle who was a steel worker who taught her harmonica on the side because she was interested. It was not something a girl was supposed to do and she received no, no encouragement to do it. Um, so that was already a kind of act of rebellion. Um, and she had heard Mexican um, and Mexican music from um, Mexican American coworkers. She worked in the Wrigley gum factory um, during the war, but when she heard Armando's music, and this was a band that was doing Mexican styles, and the band was called the Afro-Cubans. They were doing Cuban styles with some Mexican styles and some, some African-American styles. She heard something in those rhythms that, trans, that transformed her. Um, and, and it opened up new sonic worlds, new political worlds, new aesthetic worlds. She began to make connections between the, um, the Miss Mary Mack that she did growing up on the South Side and varieties of it and the music she was hearing from Armando. And amazingly, um, this woman who taught herself how to do a lot of things that weren't acceptable, even though there were no female role models, she decided to teach herself how to play Afro-Cuban rhythms. First, like on a, you know, in a, a trash can and the table she hung out at the, at the cable car village and then eventually purchased her first drum and, and it kind of took it from there. And the cover of her first album has her playing a conga drum surrounded by children 
um, who are playing other um, the claves, bongos, maracas, so other Afri Af Afro-Cuban instrumentation. Anyway, to cut to the point, I'm very much um, now involved in trying to think about Ella's musical world. And so the music, the soundtrack to my creativity is in a sense trying to listen to her listening. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, shout out to Peter Sendi, um, but obviously her music is a, is a kind of expression of her listening to Armando and her listening to Cab Calloway and her listening to Billie Holiday. I mean, I know the musicians that meant something to her. Um, and I can talk to her about it. And one of the other things is I can still listen to Ella listening because when I mention Armando to her and we've been FaceTiming every week during the pandemic, um, she starts launching into um, Miguelito Valdez's Babalu, which she first saw um, in 1945 at the Regal Theater in Chicago. So this kind of like part of the burgeoning kind of mambo craze kind of early on and she starts singing it and she starts playing an invisible drum in her retirement home and so um i've really been thinking a lot about when when ella jenkins went back to chicago around 1953 and began working with teenagers at the at the south side ywca and teaching them classes in cuban rhythm these were girls who like didn't want to get their hands calloused but she was teaching them lessons in kind of consciousness um and um and aesthetics and um by teaching them these rhythms and by using latin music as the hook you didn't want to say she was teaching them african rhythm she was teaching them latin music and that was the way that they got into it with her um, so mostly I've been thinking about how did Ella hear this? And in a way there's, you know, I have a, I have a playlist for today, um, but in a way there's no playlist because it's really trying to recover a musical world that doesn't exist in any one recording, um, but has to do with kind of these layers of um, the, the sonic world that she was inhabiting um, and trying to puzzle out, you know, and, and I should say that she's very much, you know, kind of, She's very much with us, but her memory is not so good anymore. So there are things that are very difficult to ask her at this point. Um, and so I'm living with Ella's music and trying to, I'm not trying to be Ella at all, but I wake up thinking about Ella these days and I go to sleep thinking about Ella and trying to think about how to, um, how to kind of convey the story of a life for a reader. Um, so, and otherwise, the soundtrack to my creativity is total silence because during the pandemic, I either hear my partner who's usually behind this screen or I hear Fortnite that my kid is playing in, you know, five feet away, so. <laughs> this is an incredible, Gail. I, I, I just had this movie in my head as you were speaking, imagining all these scenes and um, by trying to listen through or listen with Ella, how Ella listens, um, do you hear the world? In a different way. I mean, she seems to be all about practice. She's shifting the practice of what what it is to imagine music and what it is to engage in music for these kids and for herself, right? So, has she shifted your listening practice, not just in listening to her and what she heard, but just in a more broader sense? One of the things that Ella, so I, you know, I struggled in the beginning. So I've been thinking with Ella hard for a couple of years now, and she used to always call herself untrained or her partner Bernadelle would call her untrained. And I would say, come on, you know, what do you mean? You write this whole liner note about the sound of the South Side and that, you know, um, the notion of trained has its own ideological baggage. So she has a critique of this, but one of the things that she did is, right, when she heard Armando, she learned, and I recently listened to the podcast that uh, the Millennials Are Killing Capitalism podcast with Fred Moten and, um, uh, 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 what's his name? Hanif, um, uh, who wrote the, you guys know who I'm talking about. Anyway, um, and they were talking a little bit about, about this. She, she never said to someone, how do you do that? Right. She did this. She, she sat and she listened and she listened and she listened. And that was how she taught herself how to hear and how to play. And it seems so profound because 
she never in her music practice with children she would have them count and one and two and one and two and then she would say now do and one and two and one and two and I mean, she did it sometimes with a melody. So she never said we're doing double time. Um, and, and she managed, and so there was a way, so I've been thinking a lot about kind of black pedagogy, mm -hmm. a, a kind of black musical pedagogy and the ways that she um, made kind of music, you know, she really, this kind of, um, so I guess it's, it's caused me to think about how to listen without and I'm not a trained musician either, although I know what a minor key is and stuff like that a little bit, um, but kind of how to listen with those different kinds of big ears and listen. She was always listening and able to be able to carry it with her. I mean, I think about, you know, Daphne's work and other people's work on Zora Neale Hurston as kind of a, she was her own tape recorder. Um, when she was collecting things, she would learn songs and then, um, then she would have them. Ella did that. She she carried songs from people. Um, I just learned recently that John Lewis taught her um, ain't gonna, um, that ain't gonna, it was like ain't gonna something with my kitten anymore and that was turned into a civil rights song. The one I'm talking about. John, like she would ask people when she met them, tell me a song. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how she built her repertoire. So I guess it's kind of opened my ears to a different kind of listening that's not so acquisitive in a particular kind of way and not about mastery, but about kind of finding a way into it, even if it's a very simple way in. She never presumed to be a master um, at any of these things. Well, we're all just the steps we do every moment, right? And how can one uh, even define that as master or not trained or untrained? We're just um, flowing through our practice. It's, um, I know that both Vijay and I are really <laughs> want to ask also questions about the writing itself. And I'm just going to be so curious in having you know, read your other biographies or books that focus very much on the character, um, how this kind of black pedagogy as you are thinking about it, uh, how that will maybe flow into the way that the sentences will sound like when we read them out loud. We're gonna have a, we'll have to have a party where we just read a chapter out loud or maybe all of them. That's so, a nice fantasy, I'll hold on to that too. We're definitely <laughs> going to do that. I, I have my promise here. I'm oh. gonna hand it over to Vijay. Um, there's so, so much, there's so much to talk about today. Vijay. Oh, thank you guys. Um, well, I am going to bring in our dear, Professor Hera Jasmine Griffin. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about your new project and about your process. Um, as I said, we've known each other for quite some time and, and uh, I've been a fan of your work since, um, I think like probably the first talk I heard you give was maybe something related to When Melindy Sings. Absolutely, it was, and, uh, it was becoming When Melindy Sings. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. And, um, and I remember you even in that, talk um, thinking about the sound of a black woman's voice as in in relation to the nation and and how we think of and us and different notions of nation different registers of nation even right. um, and so I wonder if listening and belonging is a, a way in to talk about the work you're doing now because it seems like it's, it's very autobiographical, isn't it? It is. Um, well, thank you. I mean, I, our friendship has meant so much to me and I, I've learned so much from you over the years. Um, but uh, this new project is um, hybrid, I guess I would say. And it's um, very autobiographical, although it's not an autobiography. Um, it, in that way, it's similar to um, it's similar to If You Can't Be Free. It, it goes back to that moment. Um, if You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery opens with my um, curiosity about Billie Holiday being sparked from my father, particularly after my father's death. And um, Read Until You Understand goes back to that moment and does a deeper dive to that period. But um, even before I knew that that's what this book was going to be about, and then you know it, it then goes into different forms of cultural analysis as well as um, memoir. But you're you're so right. So even before I knew really what that book was about, I listened my way into it. Um, and so with all of my projects, um, 
music is, I, I didn't really even think of this until Nina said it to me recently when we were doing something else, but music really is part of my method. Um, it either helps me enter into a historical period um, when I'm thinking about people for whom we don't really have full archives, um, Black people, sometimes I'll say to myself, what were they listening to? Um, I think that uh, there's a, you know, each generation has a different way of moving in their body that is informed by the music they dance to and listen to. And so I have convinced myself that I can learn something about a period or people if I know what they're listening to. Um, so I, again, you know, I, I started this project knowing that I wanted to write in some ways about the 70s, but not knowing what form it was going to take, having no idea that it would become as autobiographical as it was. And it was actually through an assignment given to me by Daphne Brooks, when she pulled a bunch of us together. Um, and I think Nina referenced this in some of her posts about um, this event. Uh, to just do a works in progress. Um, and Nina was there and Gail was there and Imani and Salamish and Emily Lordy. And just, I mean, it was just a wonderful small working group of people. And I knew, I, I knew that I wanted to write about the seventies but I had no idea. And the sounds that I kept hearing initially were um, these again, women's voices. It was Sarita Wright, um, Denise Williams and Minnie Ripperton. And so I wrote something for Daphne's group with that, trying to figure out what I was hearing. And then it just began to, oh, and Mindy, right? Mindy was there too. It just began to unfold for me. Um, and the book itself isn't about music, but there's one chapter that is um, very musical and it's organized around the music, my family had a small restaurant and it's organized around the music that was in the jukebox. <laughs> so um, listening my way in, absolutely. Well, that's great. Um, you know, I was thinking about um, particularly, <laughs> you know, when you, when you write about Billy, when you wrote about Billy Holiday, um, it wasn't just about the sound, but it was about everything that kind of conditions the listening experience of that sound, you know, the sort of both the kind of like myth making around her um, and even just the sort of, you know, like your access to it through technology and, um, and then how the story kind of um, keeps unfolding and keeps propagating and keeps kind of remaking itself. And how that then almost intervenes on how we listen and what we're listening to. Um, so does that happen? You know, when I when when I think of it that way, it sounds like reading, right? I mean, and so I, I wonder. I asked I asked this question often. Of um, I, I asked Anthony Reed this same question, and uh, and it's because someone asked me this question a few years back, which is, is listening reading to you? Is it like reading? In all the ways that reading kind of, um, you know, you as someone who's a scholar of literature um, and have all these, these different ways of understanding how we read. I wonder if, if you bring any of that to how you listen. Wow, that's, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's such a great question. And I think that it, um, because this new book is very much about reading too. Um, I think that there are moments when listening is like reading and, and um, moments when it's a little different. So for instance, I'll, I'll return to, um, you know, this chapter uh, that focuses on, that's primarily about my family's restaurant, but then um, also, listening that occurred after the closing of that restaurant. So um, for me, I think growing up, listening was more social. It was more, you know, the music was everywhere. Like it, it was so ubiquitous, I took it for granted and didn't think of it as something um, that I was doing necessarily. It just was who we were. 
and you could learn something about somebody based on what their music was, you know? Um, and you knew that there were certain musical forms that were, were intergenerational, you know? And then there were others that were just like, oh, that's for them, you know? <laughs> but we listened together. And so that's what the restaurant was, right? That there's this jukebox and there's old music on there. So kids are listening to old music, but there's also the brand new music. And, you know, the gangsters like one thing and the, the, the working men like something else, um, but we all listen together. And yet, and still, I think, and this is where reading for me was a very solitary pleasure, um, very pleasurable, but solitary and done one on, just on my own and maybe talking about the books or being read to by my father, um, but not like that family neighborhood cookout picnic doing chores on Saturday morning. Like the only way to do the chores on Saturday morning is if Aretha's playing, right? Um, but there becomes that moment where I definitely identify reading with listening. And that's where these, those women come in because I, I didn't listen to them in community. I listened to them, heard them, discovered them by myself on the radio. In fact, Vijay, your voice sounds like one of those quiet storms. <laughs> I was joking earlier that I've become ASMR guy <laughs> in the pandemic year, since all I ever do is talk to a screen. But, uh, now it's got that sound, you know, like talking <laughs> to the night, you know. Yeah, let's so, do a podcast. You yeah, and let's I. Let's do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so I to those women. Um, I hadn't thought about this, but you were so right. And, and in some ways, it's in the book listening to them was on my own at night, listening to the radio at the same time that I was beginning to read Sula and these works by black women writers. And so a sense of what it meant to be a certain kind of black woman um, was being shaped by the sound of these women um, who are all connected to Stevie Wonder in interesting ways um, and by reading this emerging body of literature. And I realized that for that moment of the 70s, that the 70s were just very different. There was a kind of early 70s moment for me and a late 70s moment. And that late, later, not late, but later 70s moment connects the reading with the listening and they feel very, very similar because you know, at that age, you're, you're also looking for um, ways to understand oneself. Yes. And the music shapes us, and what we're reading shapes us in that way. That's right. That's right. You know, I've been thinking about this. Um, the other day, I was speaking to someone at WBGO. We were kind of doing a radio voice stand up match, like kind of, <laughs> it was like a little match or something. But, um, I was noticing that, uh, you know, the, the very strange thing about making records is that, you know, especially if you're used to live performance, is that what you're trying to do is harness what's meant as a collective experience and turn it into a private one, basically. You know, like you're going to give someone something that they might have in their lives, possibly forever, for the rest of their lives. You know, like maybe they'll have your CD or your LP on their shelf and they'll bequeath it to their kids and whatever. So, um, and that means that they live with it in a way that's very private, very intimate. And so we end up having these very intimate relationships with recorded music, even though it can also be a soundtrack to a, a notion of us or a notion of community. Um, and so that's a really interesting tension that you're drawing out here. That um, You know, I had the other, I mean, you're, you're so right. And, and then, then I think that what, what happened, um, I was finishing this book during the pandemic and um, another thing, there were new ways of, and I was thinking about listening to the jukebox with my family or at the cookout or whatever versus listening as a teenager by myself. And then I thought, and here, I think this is where you're really onto something is that there's this, there's this sort of hybrid form that emerged during the pandemic. And for me, you know, it was, um, it was the verses, right? Or, yes. or the DJ Nice, um, right. the, the DJ, you know, that. Um, right. And so I actually, in that chapter, talking about the, um, that 
you know, those evenings when we were dancing by ourselves with, yes. people, yeah. right? Which I did in my bedroom. Like, yes, I'm telling you this. Or, <laughs> we all did. It's okay. <laughs> we all did, right? Or listening to um, what felt very intimate was um, watching and listening to Jill Scott and Erica Badu. Um, <laughs> and I'm doing it. And, you know, my husband's also writing a book, so I'm trying not to disturb him. So I have my earphones on, but I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and by ourselves. And yet you're looking in the chat and it's also communal. And, yeah. and I think it also um, did something. It was a reminder of community. Right. And it was a reminder that um, both of those, both both of those, you know, D nice and the yeah. verses, right. um, was also like, you know, we're going, we're catching hell right now. Like yeah. we are dying in the pandemic and they are still shooting us in the street and we need to, we need to be together, but we can't be together. Um, and we're used to coming together, right? And the music right. is speaking to us and reminding us um, that we are a community and that we, we take joy in each other's presence. And what was possible through that was that the we the us who joined in was huge. Absolutely. Was Tens, hundreds of thousands. Exactly. Wild. <laughs> Everybody was there. But was um, both kind of familiar, but also, you know, totally. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Um, well, I know we need to move on, but I'm so glad that you're writing about verses because there was so, that was, those were such rich moments. I mean, particularly to watch an artist kind of be nostalgic about themselves you know about oh yeah I remember this part of my life you know exactly. um, so and they and have the same relationship to the records that we do even they have the same relationship to their records to each other's records to Indeed, all yeah, their records yeah. especially the early days when it was like bootleg you know <laughs> it was <wasn't laughs> highly produced you know um so yeah this is wonderful we have to oh, great, great 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 we're neighbors so we'll keep it up <laughs> for sure yes um Stick around. We're going to move on to the homie, Daphne Brooks, <laughs> um, who I believe has a whole thing. She has a whole like show for us here. But um, I did want to ask you about this word that you use to kind of start your book, which is this word arrangement and, yeah. um, and how that kind of is a way of listening, re-listening. Yes, I've got mine too right here <laughs> um it's a um, heavy thing it is it is it's it's uh worth as i say we wrote it together everybody right. everybody on this call well it's like i said about records i'm going to have this forever so i'm i'm excited <laughs> uh, oh, share, share <laughs> so so let's talk about arrangement and listening and yeah um, so we we uh, shout out to the to the French theorist Peter Zindi again. His work was so important. It's so funny because he was in residence at Princeton one of my last years there, and I, I never got to speak with him. I know my dear friend and colleague um, Alex Vasquez did, but his book Listen has been so important to a number of us, especially in trying to unseat the hegemony of the auteur. I'm not quite sure that's what Peter Zendi was up to, but we took the material that way to think about arrangement as a listening um, uh, to a listening, right? Like a, a recorded listening of a listening. And that was really important to me, um, especially in the part of this long ass book that I just published that that is not there as Gail and Farah know better than anybody else on this call. There was a third last section of this book um, and Nina knows this part of the story too. Um, on the it was, it's on the the women of um, the black women creatives involved in Porgy and Bess and rejecting and reimagining and transforming Porgy and Bess. And a lot of it is kind of like a sonic cartography of 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 um, interventionist listening and undoing and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to talk about that project today, but that's that's where I would I would go with that. I kind of thought I would, um, and first of all, thank you, Nina, and um, thank you, Vijay, um, Dream Interlocutors, and Gail and Farah, my ride or die, fairy god sisters, as I like to call them. Um, I kind of, you know, in, in, in talking a lot about this book that just came out, something that's been very clarifying, what's embedded in the book itself is that I'm, it's partially a history of Black women intellectual sound, um, and it's also about, uh, it's a story about ethics. It's about the ethics of how we listen. And so ethics, it's a story about, you know, what we, 
what we listen, what we what we write about when we listen to black women um, and trying to have kind of intimate intellectual conversations with a whole range of interlocutors about that. And when Melindy Sings was so important to my thinking and everybody else's thinking along those lines as well. So when I was trying to think about what to share today, um, since we're talking about a soundtrack to creativity and here I'll pull up my little, my little crutch, um, I, I wanted to just sort of talk about um, the way that I write and about the ethics of writing and what's been important to me in the past and in um, hopefully the future as well as I carry forward with my work. So it's a little bit of a, a playlist that's structured around um, different ethical problems and responses to problems. Um, so I've been thinking about struggle and the cathartic. And so this track that I come back to a lot when I'm writing is this one. I'll play a little bit of it. First verse, okay. Nobody knows. Glory, 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 again. glory, to the Lord. Okay, at the risk of, of speaking over this masterpiece, this is um, Pastor T.L. Barrett in the Youth for Christ Choir. I'm thinking a lot about, inspired by what Farrah was just discussing. I haven't seen my mom in a year out in Palo Alto. She just turned 95 and is as majestic as ever. But I played this in the car with her when I was taking her to the Palo Alto Four Seasons Spa <laughs> because that's my mother. And she made me stop the car. She said, what is this? Lord have mercy, I have not heard this before. Okay, um, it's extraordinary. Also to give you the span of how gripping this is, I think I was in the house, I don't know, Van Powers was there. We were at Sonic Ratman's house in Seattle. And Carl Wilson was there. <laughs> he stopped in his tracks and said, what is this? So uh, Pastor T.L. Barrett, um, it's from the 1971 album, Like a Ship. Um, you can hear him leading his majestic choir through this dazzling reading. Uh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, obviously. Um, it's a reimagining of the sacred lament that obviously leans into gospel R&B, early 70s groove, right? Um, I love the fact that it is a track that actually travels through um, fortitude, determination, dip it into the valley of despair, move, of course, as, as all you know, great scholars of gospel know, towards the light in the end, right? Um, especially by way of the incandescent ensemble that choir. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a hybrid performance as we know, the black radical music tradition always is. Frederick Douglass and others have told us that of struggle and grievance, of these limits, and vivification, right? 
Um, but I come back to this track again and again and again. Because for me, when I'm writing, um, I have to, it's a song that it, it gives me the permission to, to acknowledge struggle as, as central to the creative process. Right? Um, that writing can be both existentially lonely um, and it can also be gloriously restorative. Um, and it's also about writing towards community for me. I kind of hear that and feel hailed by that in this song. Um, so this is this is really this is a track that's important for me as a kind of um, clearing space, right? Um, to exercise your anguish, um, to get centered. Right? Um, so there's that. <laughs> Got another one for you. Okay, mutuality and collaboration. Learned so much of that from your work, VJ, and thinking about improvisation, right? Um, core ethics that always ground me in my writing. As I know, it has to be true for everybody on this call who works in black sound studies, right? Oh, a girl, a Um, so this is my my absolute favorite Aretha Franklin set of recordings of all time. Live at the Fillmore West, uncut, uncut. Um, Don't fight the feeling four disc set with King Curtis um, that came out in the early aughts. Um, it's another grounding kind of recording when I'm trying to think about engaging with whatever the work is that I'm trying to produce. It's for me a lyrical articulation of intimate mutuality, right? Um, I really, really love the way that Riri and the ensemble, King Curtis, Billy Preston, Sweet Inspirations, that they slow down the tempo, right? Um, that we know that the version that we're most familiar with is you're all I need to get by is buoyant in all sorts of glorious ways, right? But this is deep groove meditation on the meaning of care and engagement with your beloved community. It's an acknowledgement, again, of the importance of that community to your survival. It's laying down roots, embracing the value of um, one's roots within the jam itself, right? So it reminds me of why I'm writing and again, for whom I'm writing. And I can listen to this all day and all night. Okay, okay then you've got the art of restoration, right? That I think about when I'm writing, right? Okay. Um, this is, you can't take the indie out of me. You can't take the indie out of me. You start a small place and go to a bigger place. People like when you go small, you go to a bigger place. Small, big fish. Tuned in, Kip. Nature. So you've got Williamsburg's Afro diasporic indie supergroup. Um, the version of the track that I listen to often um, is, is off of their 2004 EP, um, Desperate Youth Thirsty Babes. Um, acapella kind of remixed barbershop, mayhem, and beauty. Um, but I wanted, I love this live version as well. I've called it a kind of um, lean on me for the 21st century. Um, it's an ethical anthem. It's uh, one that thinks through and, and allows me to keep at the forefront of my desires and my intent in my writing, the idea of loving your neighbor your beloved one, someone who's going to catch you when you fall. Um, it's restorative with regards to spirit. 
And again, you know, and thinking about kind of how we're all entangled with one another um, and the stories that we tell, it's important for me as a, as a kind of clarifying resolve um, in terms of thinking about the entire universe involved in the production of whatever it is I'm writing, which is why I always say, like, we wrote this book together, right? Um, that my entanglements, right, are, are central to the story that I'm telling. And that ethically, um, as critics, it would be exciting to see, especially the hegemonic class, to do, do a little bit more of that kind of thing. Right? Um, two more to wrap up very quickly. But believe me when I say, Chorus. If you will be my ambulance And I will be your screech and crouch If you will be my crush and cast And I will be your one more time If you will be my one last chance The whole sweet tree fall for me Oh, Tundi. <laughs> Uh, okay. It's interesting that it's about loving your neighbor, but it's also about proximity to violence. It um, is. Yeah. I mean, it's about precarity, right? Yeah. And and how are we going to save each other, right? Exactly, exactly. If we if we don't take on some responsibility for being able to catch each other. And yeah. do think that there's something to at least in the way that I've tried to write in recent years to try and to figure out how to catch each other. Even even the villains as I call them in my book. I'm trying to catch them and catch them. You know what I mean? Well, um, I know you called me the DJ, but I'm going to make you the selector for the next party. <laughs> the selector. <laughs> OK, uh, fair enough. <laughs> My last two entries, right. um, you know, I'm always trying to dream of futurity when I write. I think I'm the only person in the world who liked the last <laughs> Anybody else wants to share that experience? I really thought it was extraordinary. Um, Ann Litt of the great KCRW, um, she also, you know, loved this jam, 4748. So I've often said Childish Gambino, if you can imagine Prince and Stevie and Brian Wilson and a pre-red hat Kanye having a baby, you get Childish Gambino. Um, this is a penultimate track um, off his album from last spring, dropped at the dawn of the pandemic. So maybe that's another reason why people weren't feeling it. Um, Neo Salve for the angst ridden. I think it's ultimately a kind of, um, you know, a dreamscape of futurist possibility. And I always have to write with futurity in mind. And I guess that puts me in the black ops camp as opposed to that other camp. Okay, very quickly then. Uh, definitely out of time. Um, to be ready, right? Anticipatory readiness as our, our friend Danielle Goldman has beautifully written about it. I think being able to write with that kind of intent um, is a long black freedom struggle epic. And I'll just very quickly give a shout out to Damon Locks, um, who's got an incredible um, new album with the Black Monument Ensemble called Now Forever Momentary Space. There should be another parentheses, clothing parentheses there. Just about holding space as our next gen generation folk like to call it. I think there is something ethically magical about when we write, how we think about creative, creating space, about world making, Right? But the idea of being able to hold a space in your writing, right? it ties into all those other ethics of connecting to community, right? mutual care. And um, but I do think that, the, that our listening practices invite us to, to consider the kind of spaces that we make and try to sustain through our writing. So with that, Trying to keep us on time here. Oh. Wow, Daphne, you, the only, one and only. That was like Daphne explosive. Because I, I want your 
all the words were so beautiful and all the music was so beautiful and my, my attention was kind of like firing on all cylinders to try to keep up with all of that beauty thank you thank, thank you. you so much i want to bring in um all our speakers today um farah and uh, gail oh gail is here and i know that Anne has a question Anne powers Should I? So maybe we can bring in Anne too if you want to get brought in <laughs> be brought in then <laughs> i didn't know we were uh joining like actually joining. i thought you were going to ask a question for us but Hi, friends. <laughs> hey, no, you. <laughs> You're here. It's amazing, as always. I mean, I'm just thrilled to be with you all. Um, here's my question. So, um, Gail, this might start back with what you were saying, but I think I know it relates to all of your work. Um, how do you ethically deal with the point at which your listening has to become imaginary in a sense? Um, I think about this in relation to one of my obsessions, Florence Mills, whose voice was never recorded, or there supposedly is a demo, I've never heard it. But, um, you know, so I wonder what I bring to the table, what what baggage I bring when I imagine her voice, you know, but I also suspect that, like Gail, you were talking about trying to reconstruct Ella's listening practices, or I mean, I know, Fairy, you dealt with this in your masterpiece about Billy and and Daphne and your new masterpiece you deal with this. So that's my question. How do you deal with the ethics of at the point uh, where listening becomes imaginary or playlist making becomes imaginary? Uh, I guess I'll start. So I can, I, we'll, we can, we'll say like all listening is imaginary and we're always listening through our bodies. Okay, well now we've done, we've done with that. Um, you know, so assuming all of that, right? Um, I think you, I, I mean, I, if, if I'm talking about a biography, it's a very specific task. And, um, you know, you have to make your peace with that. You know, it, it, it does certain things and it can't do certain things. And so within that context, I think for me, you tread very, very carefully. I mean, I never know, you never. And so it's kind of always degrees of skating on the ice and hoping you don't, you know, like where the ice feels thicker and, um, and, and, and then also the difficulty of working with, you know, the dead speak to us, but having a living subject, um, you know, is both beautiful and complicating. Um, and uh, so that's not an answer, except I don't, except I, and this has to do with scholarly training, I think, is always having a sense of humility um, when you approach the idea of knowing anything. And especially when it comes to knowing something about a person, you know, as opposed to a text, text let us know about them. We have different permission to know about them, I think, even though there's ethics of engaging with text, but certainly engaging with a person um, becomes much deeper. So, um, so anyway, that's, that, you know, just being, trying to be humble at the same time in the project that I'm doing at some level, I have to take some of those risks. If I don't, then it won't be interesting to someone else. Like to, it, to make the story transferable, to make someone else want to listen to the story, then there's certain things that I have to do. So that's my answer. A great answer. I mean, I, 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 I agree with everything Gail said. And also, I, I think there's something so, um, there's something to be said for admitting what we don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And um, that we don't necessarily have a right to have access to everything, right? Um, and that we we approach it, we, we get as close as possible. We listen to people who actually heard and what they say and how they describe it. And we listen to a singer who says, I got this from that person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's something really, and this is where the humility comes in, right? There's something to me that's just really moving and quite um, melancholy, but in a beautiful way that there's just some things I don't have access to. Um, and, and, you know, I can imagine some parts of it, but, you know, aside from writing it as a piece of fiction, I'm just going to say, I can't even, I can't, you know, I can imagine it, but that's not getting you any closer to it. Um, so that would be my answer. 
I just want to interject and say, Farah, I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot about the kind of mistelling of the story of Buddy Bolden and the the branding of Buddy Bolden. I don't know, Jay, you might have some thoughts on that too, but you know, in the beginning of jazz and how that a little bit of that humility you're mentioning would have gone a long way in the way that story has been told. I'll just add to that, that I love the story of not knowing because it's tied to larger truths. And I tried to do that in this book is to invite people to maybe um, try a, a experiment with a different path that is not necessarily always invested in a totalizing master narrative in every sense of the word, but to think about other ways of handling the story of not knowing. So that's just kind of my jam right now. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's partly why I asked um, Farah the question I did about reading and listening, because we don't read from the standpoint of total knowledge, right? We read partially always. And so listening is always partial. And I feel like that's, I mean, the other thing is that the musician doesn't know everything about what we make, you know, um, we don't have full access to the total, you know, what was the phrase of um, Natier, the total musical fact, right? Is uh, we're just a small part of it. And so the way, the way things propagate um, no one has full access to. And this is actually something that came up in an interview I did with Muhal Richard Abrams, where um, I asked him, why, why is there music? I just asked him a very basic kind of like wide-eyed question. And he said, well, the purpose of it, the purpose of music is to excite all these different perspectives. So he embraces that, the fact that like someone will come up to you after a concert and tell you something about what happened that you did not know, you know? Um, and so, I, I mean, and I, for me, like as a, as a music maker, to experience these other ways of knowing and these other perspectives on what's happening is, uh, makes me a better listener and makes me a better, hopefully someday, a better artist. Wow. <laughs> I thank you so much, everybody, for all of this. I'm my head is exploding, and I'm already thinking about rewatching this very conversation that I'm part of uh, and re-listening. Um, I know that Robbie, my dear friend Robbie, um, has a question. Um, can you uh, turn your video on? Oh, there you are. So you can be highlighted. Hello. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Um, I had a question for all the panelists. Could you speak about practices of listening while actually in the act of writing, whether that's pen and paper or typing? And in particular, I was wondering, do you sing? Do you dance? Uh, you know, if music is motion and thinking is embodied, then what kinds of revelations come from these synergies? And when do you prefer silence? I'll, I'll go first. Um, um, I, so these days i can't i can't um multitask writing and listening um because i'm listening to my own internal voice when i write and if i, I it, there's no such thing as like ambient music for me when i when i write um and so there's a kind of right now but that changes in life right now there's a pretty absolute separation that said i'm a hummer um i hum when i write and i don't know if it in other words i think of writing like i think of making a rhythm and I'm not sure that I'm the best person at that. I don't know if you read my sentences and you would notice that, but when I write, it has to, the hums have to work out um, in, a, in a way. So I do think of the rhythm of the sentence at the level of the sentence. Um, and I do think about meter, uh, you know, even though I'm not a poet. So um, there's a kind of musical, music making piece of, of writing for me. And it's very like, it's unconscious. I just realize, oh, I'm humming. I hope it's not annoying to the people around me. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I'm, I'm such an engaged listener that it's hard for me to listen while I write. Um, and I also I listen to my writing, and I I like I listen. I want to hear how it sounds. Um, I read it aloud. I hear it in my head. Um, it comes to me. It wakes me up. Uh, but I do listen in between. And sometimes I'll tell you when I'm really stuck, 
um, almost always when I'm stuck, music will crack it open. Like music and going for walks, nothing cracks it open for me like going for a walk or listening to music. And I'm one of those annoying people when I'm sitting somewhere and live music is being played, I always have a notebook and I'm scrambling and writing something down in the dark that I can't read because that music just popped it open for me. And um, oftentimes what comes to me on walks and listening to live music are last sentences. And so I know where my book or essay is going to end, but I just got to figure out how to get there. And that's a gift that music and walking give me. I love that. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm the opposite, Farah. I always have a first sentence. And I often, I mean, this is very, I think, our, our dear grand dame Morrisonian, not comparing myself at all, but in the sense of those first sentences being so powerful, um, I will sometimes a sentence will come to me often um, about, I know I have some kind of a piece that I'm getting ready to write. And it's not necessarily tied to the music, I think at all, but it becomes the kind of synecdoche for something larger. And I tend to listen. I also like everyone else, I find it distracting to, to listen. Like I've I find it stressful to listen to music most of the time, but if I don't, unless I'm, because I know I'll always go to work, but um, I do like to listen to whole recordings in between writing and to live inside of the music. I've also write alongside of, and this comes from, you know, two decades of going to the pop conference in Seattle and being involved in critical karaoke from its origins, um, just writing through the event of the recording. Um, I very much, I find that incredibly generative, but also the songs that I was just sharing, those are songs that I always go back to. And I will, to answer your question about movement, I will usually pace. If I'm listening to one of those songs, I'm kind of pacing and, and trying to ground myself. So thanks for that question. Thank you so much, Rambi. And I think you were coming to us from uh, Istanbul and I see people here from Cambodia. I see people from Europe, uh, West Coast, neighbors of mine, East Coast, all over the place. So this is a truly international resonating conversation. I'm going to bring in uh, Darius who runs with Paris. I don't know where Darius speaks from, but... Hey, hey, I'm tucked away in Kansas. Um, I'm geeking out really hard right now because I bridge all and I keep returning to it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, my question is connected to Robbie's, um, but I'm really interested in the sounds that spill into your work and surprise you, right? So like when you're writing about music, sometimes you can like focus on a song or a moment in a song, but are there like whispers or shouts or moans or Gail in your case, Fortnite? Like are these other sounds that kind of creep into your work and maybe when you're doing an editorial pass, you know, you clock it? Um, I'm just, I'm nosy. I'm also a runner. I don't know if anyone here is a runner, but but music is very controversial, you know, in terms of being a runner. There's times, you know, there's a kind of runner who doesn't want to listen to music because like, it's like a crutch. Like you, you got to learn how to listen to the rhythms of your body. And then, you know, or there's the kind of like using music as, um, you know, in that kind of um, mechanical way. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. I, I, I it, this is popping into my head. Um, and I do feel like, there are certain, so when I, and, but, and I, I, I haven't planned this, but I, when I make these days, I'm during the pandemic, I got bored. And so for the first time in years, I'm running with, you know, earphones and then it's about BPM, you know, kind of like matching the music literally to my body so that it's comfortable for me to run. It can't be too fast. It can't be too slow. Cause then I can't run to it. Um, and, but I would say that sometimes there are things that, and then sometimes my soundtrack then is like, I'm trying to keep up. I'm trying to like listen to some stuff that's coming out. So I know what like the young people are listening to. Um, there's that keeping up pressure that I sometimes feel. So, um, but I, sometimes those things that are like, it's not music that moves me, but it does like pop something open. Um, and so I hear a lot of Fortnite stuff. Fortnite is very music and dance intensive. Um, there's a lot of music going on next to me. I have no idea what that music is. Um, but sometimes it can really, you know, I feel like there's like these jarring sounds that, um, you know, kind of can wake you up because um, all of a sudden you get used to, you get in your groove, 
you know, of this, the stuff that, of the, you know, I feel like this with the, with the running soundtracks, it's the BPM and I'm in a groove and you need something to get you out of it sometimes. And sometimes a certain sound can do that. Oh, I, um, that's great. I, I hear, um, so this is probably saying more about my mental health than I want to admit, <laughs> but I carry voices in my head and um, I hear them all the time. And um, I, hear, I hear the voices of my mother and my grandmother and my aunts and my teachers and my nemesis. <laughs> so um, those, are, those are the things that usually intrude when I'm writing more so than um, the music. I have a different relationship to the music, um, but the voices that I carry in my head. And, and then I, I fancy that, um, I hear the voices sometimes of my subjects. You know, I think it was Gail who said, "You write the sub, you write the chapter. You don't start with the first chapter. You write the chapter that's most, um, you know, kind of writing you right then." And I remember when I was writing Billie Holiday, really struggling with something and being awakened in the middle of the night, saying, "Start with this chapter," and it just came to me, and I convinced myself that it was Billie Holiday telling me where to start. So um, I hear that it's the voices the sounds that I hear that are always with me and accompanying me all the time. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't go anywhere anymore, as we all know, but I, I know that, I mean, especially my, my 33 and one third on Jeff Buckley was, it was not literally, but in my head written in the car, um, living in Los Angeles, and listening to the radio, which is still, Alex Vasquez was recently time now, she still listens to the radio. She said, I don't know what the Spotify thing is. And that's true for me, I don't even think about it. I've listened to KCRW, um, which is a transformed radio station now, at least in the mornings with Anthony Valdez and Davina Carmel, who's Sly Stone's daughter, um, much more inclusive universe. But I've listened to that, that radio station since 1991, fall of 1991. And so there's a way that the radio as soundscape created a heterogeneity of different kinds of sounds, especially on that station that I think had something to do with the different rhythmic structures that Gail has talked about in my writing, sometimes in different affective moods. So I think that's how it kind of permeates my prose or it used to, you know, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darius. Well, Vijay, what is, what is the soundtrack to your creativity? I mean, we know what, how you can be, how you are all, uh, oftentimes soundtracks to our creativity, but let's turn it around. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I, um, I think I actually kind of found myself inspired by seeing Daphne speak uh, more than many times, um, and particularly that she'd do these kind of voiceovers. Uh, but also I'd find that like when I write specifically about music, which, um, you know, sometimes people invite me to do, then I find myself using language in a very different way. So it actually, because I find that when I'm writing, I can't listen. When I'm listening, I can't write, you know, but, but then when I try to get right in the middle, right in between those two things, there's something going on there that I actually don't even really understand about myself, about there's something that gets activated and the language is different. I can tell like my prose is different. The, the flow of words is different. Um, and, but then I also find like, if I'm going to perform that, then I need like to just sit in silence for a while. Like I need to just sit in a dark room sometimes, you know, sometimes literally into extreme degrees, <laughs> just like sensory depriva deprivation chamber or something like that to or turn the dressing room into that so that I can um, uh, access some other part of myself that's not verbal, that's not, um, that's not concerned with uh, getting something right or getting, you, you know, finishing a sentence or these kinds of things. So yeah, I'm, I find myself in this weird zone where language and musicality kind of complete, but also kind of confound one another. So I'm not answering your question either. 
Nina, how about you? You are, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was typing to Josh because uh, Josh, you need to turn on your camera before we can spotlight you. That was what I was trying to tell you. Um, Nina, can you tell us your soundtrack to Creed? I can, I can. I, I have, and this is why it's so secret. I feel it's so uh, personal. I think I will never tell people what I listen to when I write. It's a complete secret. And I have a list that is just my writing music and it's music I've heard, listened to for maybe 20 or 30 years, just on repeat. <laughs> and they're just a very a handful of songs or pieces. And um, I don't know, they have to be just so familiar that they just feel like my skin or like feels like me, but at the same time, they're like, not me. I, they take me to a place and they're really like, it wouldn't mean anything to anybody else. They're completely random. Something I just heard on the radio and I felt like, ah, oh, that, that one can work. And I think I've found a new one now, but so that's kind of my, my method, but uh, nobody will know the content of the method. <laughs> Josh, uh, one time co-host, always co-host. Josh was the, my, one of my co-hosts for our last Soundtrack to Creativity event. And I wanted to bring you in. I know you have are curious about our, our friends here. Um, I was about to go make lunch. Ooh, okay. I got summoned, I got summoned out of the darkness. Um, do you want, is there a question, Nina, or, or a question for the group? Yeah, I was just wondering if you wanted to join us with the last question. I, I actually wanted to maybe I could pick up on something and, and something that Anne referenced in the chat as well, um, indirectly. But um, I, I've been thinking a lot because in the conversation we had for the first event about these, some similar questions around music in our in our heads as we write. And one of the things I realized only recently in my own life, and I'm curious if others have thoughts or similar experiences, is um, m my whole life I've had a, um, a speech impediment that I, I've, I hide very successfully. Um, and only recently did I realize that I write in a kind of pattern of, uh, of commas, <laughs> of endless commas, to establish a rhythm that allows me to speak it out loud, to read it, to read the text out loud in a way that I don't get stuck on words. Um, and so if I don't have that kind of almost like a staccato um, uh, a pattern, I, I, can't, um, I can't say the words. And so I've, I've only literally in the last year realized this about myself um, and started to understand the way that I was writing on the page was actually following a music that I didn't even know I needed in order to speak. Um, and so I'm just curious also if there's also, um, kind of limits that we all have, maybe limits is the wrong word, but, but, but kind of obstacles or things we wrestle with that, that, um, impacts the, the music that we need to write, not just the music we want, but the music that we need. Thank you so much for sharing that, Josh. It's really, really, um, beautiful and interesting. I, I mean, I have an automatic response to that. And I was thinking about it today. One of the things about studying someone who works on children's music is you think a lot about children in a kind of beautiful way. Um, we're not, we're, you know, unless you work on children's literature, we don't usually think about children at all, you know, um, it, um, you know, so one, and one of the things that um, I've been thinking about, ex, you know, kind of um, accessibility in our methods. Um, kind of one of the things that, so I'll speak just with Ella Jenkins as a way of answering this question uh, or the prompt is that she realized she did work with developmentally disabled kids of all sorts. Um, and one of the things, but this is not about ability. This is about universality, about access, universal ac accessibility is that she realized that people re respond to rhythm even when they can't speak. So when she was speaking, when she was working with kids who were who had limited ability to speak. You could also, you could say, boom, boom, and you do it now too. And they could do it. And there was something about it that everyone walked away, all these kids walked away from what she was doing, feeling empowered and feeling like they had been part of something, even if they had just clapped together. And there's something about that, you know, kind of stripping, um, there's something, I'm trying to figure out how to talk about the genius of stripping it down to that, how she got to that um, and how that, 
which is kind of a lesson for children is also such a powerful lesson for all of us. It was like getting to the element and not being worried somehow that like she didn't have the tools to do it. And so just thinking about, I was speaking this morning to someone who's a music therapist, um, just, a, 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 and, and so this is in my mind because she talked about, you know, the, yeah, you know, kind of these elements of music that can be accessible, that can give us speech in this case, even if it doesn't come easily to us. I am, um, I'm still thinking through that question and, and then just blown away by what Gail just shared with us. Um, so I don't think I have an answer, uh, you know, except to say that um, I, I think I have crutches sometimes um, that aren't really, um, that, I, that, that I'm familiar with, like I, and that I try to sometimes break myself out of. Um, and I don't know if crutch is the right word, but it's, um, you know, like I believe in, like I like, here it is, okay. Sometimes um, I have to say, you, you have to forego the nice sound for the meaning. <laughs> And my gut is to always go with the sound of something that I'm writing. And um, I like threes. <laughs> ba -da, ba -da, and, ba and, I, and I don't like Anne. I don't like Anne. I don't like the word Anne. Um, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, you know, and, and I always write that way. And I go back and I go back through those sentences and I say, but what does that mean? It sounds really pretty, but what does it mean? And um, I, it's hard to give up the sound. If I can't do both sound and meaning, it's hard to give up the sound to give in to the call for meaning for me. Um, and I, you know, have I, I have fights with copy editors over the use of and, and also over and, and I'm just the opposite, Josh. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't know a comma if it slapped me in the face. <laughs> like like. I'm an English professor and the commas, I have to be encouraged to use those. That's so funny because when I was reading your bio, I was like, I think I need to stick an and in here. <laughs> that might have been that right there. Um, um, it, hey, Josh Kuhn, that was a really beautiful and challenging question. And um, I appreciate it so much. I've been thinking about how I would answer it. And I, I, I think for me, having taught in a racist English department for 13 years, I found my solace in being able to write about music, which I'd always wanted to do. I kind of accidentally ended up doing English. But, but in, in terms of taking taking the road of solace, it was also um, a path towards power, which I don't think I really, I, th I didn't think about self-consciously, but if I, if I really examine the aesthetics of how I've written for a while about music, um, it's about quickly establishing whole worlds. That's often how I'm, I'm setting up writing a talk for EMP or anywhere else about sound and about black women in performance about kind of claiming the space and seizing the space, um, about acknowledging my control over the narrative. But more recently, and this came really through writing the last portions of the book um, and writing alongside of events like ones that we had like uh, for Sidia, the Barnard Salon for her and being asked to write about her book. I started writing um, more actively um, in a way that in, thinks about mutuality and inviting other people to be vulnerable with me in listening to the music. And that comes from Morrison, really, you know, um, the, the opening line of a mercy, don't be afraid, you know. So I think that that's kind of, that speaks to my own, you know, hyper mindfulness about intersectional catastrophes in our world and has something to do with how I write. Thanks, man. Thank you, everybody. My goodness, um, there's so much to process here. I, I um, 
your last line, Vera, reminds me of how this whole uh, concept of this series came about. And it was just this beautiful sounding and deeply and clearly articulated, Vera, <laughs> sentences where you spoke about um, in an event we did in the fall where you spoke about the soundtrack to the pandemic. That's, I think, how you kind of entered it, talking about beginnings. And then it started to be about the soundtrack to you writing this book that is coming out in October. And you talked about how actually you're not writing about the music very much, but that it, the music is just all enveloping the scenes and you, and you of course told us about the, the specificities of the jukebox and the restaurant. So this whole series was really birthed from Farah's rhythms, <laughs> Farah's commas, <laughs> and, um, and Farah's mind uh, and heart. So thank you so much for giving us this whole format and this question, Farah. Uh, and I, I wanted to just thank everybody um, for being here today. And of course, especially to uh, Daphne, um, to Gail, to Farah, and to the whole Pure Lab team. A big shout out to Ramona and to, um, to Charlie, who is here as well, um, and to the tech team at the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music who helped us make this event possible. And a big, big, big um, singular thank you to Vijay for co-hosting this with me and for preparing this beautiful time together. And if you're in more interested in thinking more about writing and music, um, my, one of my peer lab collaborators, Juliette Belloc, um, who is a graphic designer and social justice activist, will be doing an event with me on June 24th and we'll send you information about that. I'm going to try to, um, I think about it as demagnetizing uh, unuseful and harmful language around music. Um, and that we don't know where we're going, but we're going to try to demagnetize this, this force field that we no longer need <laughs> and we have never needed. So thank you again so much for spending this time with us. Um, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute your microphone and say hi if you would like, and um, we'll see you in June, hopefully. <laughs>